Hello, my fine listeners. This is Jim the Keys Bartender coming to you back from my overseas travel in Poland here in Key Largo. And two weeks, whenever I go away from here, it's amazing, especially since I had left right at the beginning of what we call lobster mini season. And if you go back to past episodes, you'll know that lobster mini season is, you know, for the Caribbean lobster they have down here, uh, allows just regular people to take six lobsters per day for uh, 48 hours. And I missed that. It's kind of a, uh, when I'm saying missed it, I didn't miss it. I missed it because I wasn't here. I didn't miss, I never went out for it. I just thought it was kind of like a free for all. Everyone dropping in a boat to grab a Caribbean lobster. I'm not really nuts about lobster, um, especially Caribbean lobster. I'm a cold water lobster guy. But I was told it was eventful, meaning it was busy and it was fun and people had a good time. And I reason I understand why people would. It's just like a lot of things to do. I, I really, I'm not a big fan of the event because it comes right before the commercial season. And even though I don't know in particular people that just depend on lobstering, I can imagine that to watch a bunch of people go in after your livelihood. And a lot of people, it's not, I'd have to say there's a small but active minority of people that that show up for lobster mini season that abuse it. So you're only supposed to get six lobsters per person that on a boat. <clears throat> and that's the whole day. And people, what they do, and they catch them every so often, they would take a cooler, fill up a cooler, take it off the boat, tra- get another boat, transport it to the docks, uh, you know, fill up a cooler again. As long as you just don't have it on your boat with your people, then... You're, you're good. and um, But, you, I mean, I imagine if you're listening to this show, you're not the kind of person to do something like that. You would already been... You're not guilt-ridden by it. You're not guilt-ridden. You just don't listen to people that tell you you're, you're an asshole because you abuse the privilege of being able to take these things. And from what I understand is that they replenish pretty quickly because... Um, I can't go into depth on it because I'm not an expert on it. So I won't. Just saying that the eggs and the way they flow and stuff like that, it, it's a circular path from the Everglades, uh, from the mangroves out and things like that. So no matter whenever they clear all the lobsters out, there's always more lobsters next season, which is an oddity when you think about it because whenever they take all the fish out of an area a lot of times you don't see any more fish so kind of destroys the ecosystem but you know how you know how humans are right they just seem to just take 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 until it's gone remember massachusetts there's a place called cape cod and what don't they have at cape cod anymore they don't have cod because those fish are Fisheries were overfished. And everyone does it, not just Americans. And, you know, the Chinese are doing it now. I'm sure the Russians have done Japanese. Japanese are still whaling. But this show isn't about that. So I was gone for two weeks. My girls were gone for seven weeks. We, um, I don't think I did any podcasting from the airport. But I had left last Friday on Thursday day I'm going to finish up talking about that on Thursday day we're in my we're staying in my wife wife's hometown so we're going to be traveling the next day on Friday this is last Friday uh, with my daughter Sky Abby and Abby's sister Yolanda and I and in order to get on the plane when you're checking in you have to have a negative test for COVID and what we did is we went to a local hospital in our hometown. And we went to the hospital. 
And it's funny because a lot of some restaurants required and stores require masks. But we went to the hospital and the hospital, half the people that worked there were wearing masks, half of them weren't. So we went and got the test. There were, uh, it, uh, it took 45 minutes to get the results. 45 minutes. So we had our uh, test results. We had uh, spent our last day saying goodbye. Oh, it's a funny thing. On Wednesday night, our rental car, we were visiting Abby's brother in a town uh, a little east and north of Abby's hometown. Let's say about 30, 40 kilometers and uh, we stayed till I'm not drinking, so I'm the designated driver the whole time. And they're on, they're in the country, and uh, so we're we're in Poland. We're in a place called Tarnov, and they're saying goodbye, tearful goodbye to their family. And we get in the car, and it won't start. It don't even have that click, click, click of the starter trying to turn and you know not having enough battery power it's what you know cars today a lot of the cars they seem that they're like golf carts where when you're idling they just go to a real low idle or even turn off and it's kind of ignitions the engine starts up when you hit the pedal well it didn't do any of that but there was plenty of battery power because all the accessories were working and there was seemed to be excess juice so I, that wasn't it. Um, we thought, thought, thought. And it turned out at the end, you know, it's funny because they, they're very handy over there. I'm handy too, but I mean, they started opening up the hood and they were looking at the car and all this stuff. And I thought they were going to start taking it apart, the, the guys, the nephew, um, Dominic, and uh, the father, uh, Bogdan. So, no, they didn't. And... Uh, they, they didn't take it apart. And when they called, the wife called the rental agency, it turned out they disabled the car because it had a certain amount of time where it needed an oil change. And they disabled it. And they were trying to get a hold of her. And they may have had the wrong phone number or whatever. But they didn't. They, they didn't get through and then just said, well, they'll, we'll disable it and they'll have to call us. And we did. And it took us about 40 minutes to get it restarted. And then he told us we, they had to change out. One day before we were leaving, we had to change out the car, which I really don't understand. We would never have put on more. We, well, we would have put another 60 kilometers on it, which works out to be about 40, 40 miles. So I don't know how that would have avoided the... Uh, whatever warranty to get oil change and things like that. But they were really tricky about that. And uh, even the day, we, we, so we got back, we, they re-enabled the car Thursday night, Friday morning. I got up and they disabled it again. It was sitting right there. And we had to go and get the test. And we so we ended up having to walk into town. And then they started calling us. That they, when could they meet us? And they said, well, we're walking now because you disabled the car. Uh, so... We'll be back when we get back. The town wasn't that far away. It was uh, less than a half a mile. So we walked into town and got our test and all that stuff. And then we got a new car and all that stuff. And yeah, everything pretty much was cut and dry there. We, we showed up at a small regional airport on Friday uh, around 1030. I think it was around 1030. And the, they started boarding flight around twelve, and it's a, it's a nice modern small regional airport where you go on the second floor and there's literally four gates that go out, and they got a little duty free shop, little snack bar, and stuff like that. And we got on plane, flew to Warsaw. Oh, we had turned over our test. When we were checking in, they saw those, gave them back to us, and gave us a ticket. They wouldn't have gave us a ticket. They wouldn't have booked us if we didn't have the test. So that we're, we're traveling inside of Poland right now. 
So that's when they looked at the test. Okay, which it wasn't a requirement for Poland, but they it was a requirement for the U.S. The test for leaving, the test for leaving, because I, I don't think they really care if you're leaving whether you take the test. They probably want you out if you if you you end up positive. But we go to Warsaw. There, uh, it's a big airport. If maybe not as big as Berlin, or, or maybe. Uh, Paris, but it's a pretty big airport. Lots of gates. And we go there and we have to go through European customs and they ask for the test again when you're going through. The, I mean, I don't know if they were asking for the test then. I'm not sure. But this is like, it may be that they didn't ask for another test at all. So if I had gotten into that airport without a test. Once we got to the gate where we're supposed to leave, there was, uh, you know, they checked your ticket, but they you needed to sign a piece of paper that said you had a negative test within three days. One side's English, one side's Polish. And you sign them. And that was it. And they, and they give you the paper right before you get on the plane. And they didn't show them any of the tests. Um, so... If we had figured a way on how to get into the airport without getting, I guess, they used to, I, I, I really is kind of convoluted. I don't understand why, if you take the test, why do you have to fill out a paper? Why don't you just hand in tests? Wouldn't you rather have the test than a piece of paper that says you swear you got a test? But there's no proof that you had a test other than that you had a test and it's negative. But. We got on a plane. It was a nice plane. It was a Dreamliner, I think, a 787. Not sure. Maybe it was an Airbus or anything like that. Not super big. Not a jumbo. You know, it has that, what's that? The three, it was a 333 configuration, one level. Three seats on the one side, three seats in the middle, three, three on the side. So we get there. We didn't get all our seats together, but got all the three girls in one row. And I'm immediately behind him in a, in a row. And as we got on the plane, the wife noticed that there's a young lady sitting next to her in the, on the left side, and there's two empty seats. And she goes, you should just go and sit there. And I'm like, well, I'm self-aware. I realize I, I, maybe I should ask, you know, even though you don't really have to ask, but I, I do. So I said, hey, would you mind if I sat there? And she goes, no, not at all. And um, I sat there, and it turned out, very nice woman. I don't know if I should say her name on the, on the plane, but she was, uh, she's a lawyer or, or paralegal. I don't, we didn't get into detail about it, but she works at a law firm in Miami, and she's native Montenegrin, Montenegro. It's a former Yugoslavian republic. Uh, I think it's on the south side of Croatia, but it, it uh, she was there, and it, it's kind of a, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but if you ever saw the movie, they show the best sides of Montenegro in the movie Casino Royale, the James Bond one, and the one with Daniel Craig the beautiful parts of it, but there's, it's, uh, you know, ocean, it's right on the Adriatic, I guess, and it uh, has mountains, and it's, I mean, she, she was born there, but you could tell her accent, she's American, and her father's from, father's from there, and she had taken a trip that taken about two more hours than we had, and we sat there, and we talked the whole time, very nice young woman, I think she was 30-something, I mean, turned out. But the way she talked, I mean, she has, I was guessing her age because not by she looked, she could have been 28. But it turned out she was a little older than that. I, I shouldn't, I guess I shouldn't be saying, but I didn't say her name, so that's good. But I guess if there's a person in Miami, I don't have hundreds of listeners in Miami, maybe I have like 50 or 60, but um, what a sweet, sweet, sweet girl, pretty girl too. And we, we chatted a lot about history, about Montenegro, about flying, uh, uh, about she's from originally from Montenegro, but I, I guess she was born in Montenegro. And but 
she lived in Chicago most of her life, and I'm from Philadelphia. And we were just relating in a big city thing, and she likes how much she likes Miami. And I think she moved to Miami right before COVID, and it worked out good. And she's been, sounds like she's very good at what she does. So it was nice. And it was funny. My wife kind of said, hey, do, he talks a lot. She told him he talks a lot. So he did that. And the flight over was, flight back was uneventful. Watched a couple movies. Did, stupid, 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 stupid. I didn't make allowances for sleep. You know, it's six hours time change. And coming back is always a problem for me. Not so much going over. Coming back was always a problem. But I didn't know how much of a problem it was going to be. So the flight, like I said, the flight was great. The wife sent me back for uh, some lemons one time. And I went in the back. And I'm talking to the, you know, all the flight attendants. They speak Polish and English because in that part of the world, you get Ukrainians, Romanians, Hungarians. People that get into Miami, a lot of times they... They, they fly through Warsaw, so they said, you know, they're either they're going to do announcements in Polish and English. And the flight attendants speak English. So I go in the back, and I'm, I, I ask for some lemons. And right at the end, I don't know why, I, I, I always kind of do that. I said, you guys are doing a really good job. You're very uh, pleasant. There was one guy and two girls. I wasn't like, uh, I'm at an age right now where I don't, do that flirting thing with people because that's kind of ridiculous uh, when you're in your late 50s. I mean, you could. You know, I'm not the world's most interesting man, but I'm certainly play, I can play one more often if I wanted to pretend to be one. So I'm sitting there and I'm telling, I'm sitting, I'm standing there telling them how much I like it and how much I enjoyed their service and how hard their job was. And I told them I'm kind of like in the same business which may have misled them because I, I work in a restaurant business and I didn't say I was a bartender or anything like that. Well, I did my fast talking and all that stuff and they were nice. They said, hey, take whatever you want. You know, and with their accent, take whatever you want. And if you want drinks, go and help yourself. How much wine you want. And, yeah, and international flights, they don't, don't bother with wine and beer and stuff like that. You just say, if you want to get a beer, then come back and you can grab a couple beers. So, um, what I did was I walked back to the seat, gave it lemons and stuff like that. And then Abby went back eventually to get some, maybe some more water or coffee or something like that. And the, uh, the flight attendant goes, does your husband fly for Air France? And I go, and Abby goes, what did you say to them? And I said, I did not say I was a pilot for Air France. I, I mentioned that I work in the restaurant business, but maybe I th- maybe sounded something like I said. Air Fr- I, I don't remember saying Air or France or anything in combination of that. But I did attempt to say some Polish, like thank you, Zinkuya, you know. That's Vizinha, or Zenia. It's not Dosvidanya, that's Vizinha, which is, there's a Polish and there's a Russian way. So I, I don't know what happened there. But the flight was, uh, other than that, was uneventful. I had a wonderful time sitting there. Uh, I had, when I, sometimes when I fly, especially when, the, when I'm not sleeping, my stomach starts bothering me. And it's one of those things where, and I'm not, if you're eating, I apologize, but on a plane and you eat peanuts and all that stuff, you start feeling like you either have gas or diarrhea. And you don't want to have either one, really. And luckily, you know, you have to get... I, being in my late 50s, I worried about drinking too much liquid and having to get up and go down, up and down to go to the bathroom. I didn't want to have to do that. I didn't have to do that. I had to do it because I felt like I had gas. But I didn't know if it was, you know, you're not sure if it's gas. It it wasn't. It was gas. It was just upset stomach. And... There wasn't anything attached to it, let's say. I don't have to go into detail. But that that was the one thing. So we had the flight. We go we go there, you know, to get them going through customs was crazy easy because it was almost eleven o'clock at night, ten thirty at night. 
and we were we had four people in front of us in the custom line. I mean, they had all in Miami. They have a pretty vigorous setup there for that, you know. And there wasn't long lines. And then we went out and we waited about fifteen minutes for our luggage. It came up and came home. Now, I'm done talking about Poland. Let's talk about jet lag. Jet lag. Now, when you're coming home from a trip like that, you think, well, I'm coming home at midnight. I don't want to work, really don't want to work the next morning. Right? Which I could have done that. I could have gotten out and just went went into work and came home. It was a Saturday the next day. So... I hadn't have slept on the plane because I ended up chatting and watching movies and I may have drifted off maybe 15, 20 minutes, which I should have done because with the six hours, it ended up Friday was 30 hours long. I go in Saturday, I shower, get ready, blah, blah, blah. I walk in the door and, and people are greeting me, the regulars are saying hi. There's not a ton of people there, so I didn't have... And I'm feeling pretty good. And then progressively... My body starts telling me, Jim, you fucking idiot. Why didn't you try to sleep some uh, on the plane? Why didn't you sleep? Why didn't you sleep three, four hours? Well, I mean, it felt my stomach started cramping. Uh, I thought it had, I thought it was coming down. I had a problem breathing, but that was from fatigue. It was a fatigue. That's a thing I had. I had a problem breathing because of fatigue. My muscles, I felt like a baby. I tried to pick up like one of the things, like a 50 pound, whatever the, the box of syrup we use for a soda system. I'm picking it up. I'm using all my strength to do it. And it felt like I'm maybe twisting my back because I'm using half half strength. Um, I don't know if I can open up a twist off. You know, Most of the wine bottles that have the plastic on it, I could just twist it off, power through it. I couldn't I couldn't do that. I was slow. At one point I had wait, my dog's freaking out. She's barking at a cat. Um come on Roxy. So I'm I c I can't even muster enough energy to fake. Fake it till you make it, you know. Be happy. I was just... It was, it was the... The weirdest fatigue thing I ever felt in my life. I've done the two days no sleeping when I was younger. And I felt... You feel kind of hollowed out. You're not sleeping if you drank too much and you don't sleep too much and you're up. I've done that. I've done that before. And I had the headache. And I did it. I could physically... I had done it. And this one just felt so much different. The, when I got in my car at the end of the night, yes, I drove I drove there because I was kind of tired. It was only, it's only two and a half blocks away. I didn't feel like walking. And when I was driving back, it felt to be the most impaired driving I've ever done. Remember, I don't drink anymore. Anymore. Or any less. No, I don't drink anymore. I abstain from drinking. So, I was, I was thinking, well, up here I got to make a left turn and then I got to make a right turn and put my lights on, make sure I back up, there's no one behind. I mean, it was a shit show. A time during the night of making change and I had to give someone, I can remember right now, it was 76, 64, the change. 76, 64, meaning that was 30, that a bill... 33, 36, okay, was the bill. And I had 120 in a drawer, I had 10s and 5s. And I had to give them the 20, and I needed 5 10s, right? Oh, no, it was 70-something. Yeah, it was 70, so I had to give them 5 10s. And I kept on counting 6 10s and 5 10s. I'm doing for three minutes, I'm putting a 10 back in the drawer and then I'm taking a 10 out at one time I'm counting 6 10s another time I'm counting 4 10s I couldn't get ready it was like 3 minutes it was incredibly bad that my math skills at that time 
I'm, I'm using a calculator. I'm thinking, I, I can't be trusted with any of this stuff. And there was one of my favorite regulars, Morris, was there. And it felt so bad because he wanted to hang out. And I couldn't hang out. I'm right, I could hang out because I'm right around the corner. But I couldn't hang out because I couldn't. I, I was done. I was done. So, yeah, I, I, he wanted to hang out, you know, when you turn off the thing. And the owner's areas were, we, we enjoy his company. It's never a problem. But I said, I got to go. I am so sorry. And I, he didn't quite get it. But um, how exactly how I felt. And you really can't. How do you tell someone how exactly you, you feel? And say, because I didn't, I didn't walk out. But normally, there are people that would leave work at that time and ask to leave work and say, I'm sorry, I can't stay here anymore. I got to go. Uh, that's, I, I would have done in some other circumstances, but not when I'm the lone man at the end of the night. So I stayed there. Luckily, our chef was still there, and he stayed with the people locking up. And uh, when I got home, I parked the car, made sure I turned everything off, had a hard time getting in the door because of the keys. It was dark. I didn't have the lights on, but I wasn't doing, I wasn't feeling the force, you know, where I found the right key and put it in the door. So I go in. I'm thinking, I can go right to bed right now. But then I said, oh, I, was, I felt hot and cold. And all at the same time, I said, I better shower. You know, showering was a chore. It was incredible. I never felt that power of jet lag. And it wasn't, it's only six hours. We got people that come from Moscow. Moscow's a lot further. India. All those places. Tokyo, 12 hours. You know, 12 hours difference. But I mean, it takes a lot longer. 12 hours to make the trip. Uh, I, I, it's just... It just never, I didn't know if it was my age or because I didn't prepare for it. I mean, next time I could have, what I should have just done was, um, I think I should have stayed up late. Stayed up late two days to like one, two in the morning. Slept at, slept at eight, two to eight. Get my six, I mean, if I get six hours, I'm okay. Two to eight. And I'd be pretty good. I'd only be off like a couple hours, like three three hours instead of... But that feeling was incredible. So I'm done talking about jet lag. I'm going to do something a little better next time. I've, I've, I've uh, discovered B12. B12 drops work great for me. Uh, and some magnesium that helps you absorb, you know, the, the energy from your food and do it more efficiently. That worked for me. And I went to the gym yesterday. Amazing thing about the gym. I haven't really done any major cardio. You saw, if you saw any pictures on the Facebook page that I have the Keys Bartender or my personal one, Jim Haran, right? Uh, you saw that I was in the mountains. And we were up pretty high. And I get this burning sensation when we're doing some climbing, some vigorous climbing. Not, not the, you know, the... Stuff we use the pythons and the, and the lines and all the spikes and all that stuff, but there was still pretty steep climbing. Uh, when I ran yesterday, I didn't get any of the burn. I had to, you have to wear the hospital I work in because we're in Florida, reinstituted the mask, and I didn't get the burn. So I guess maybe that hiking in the mountains worked as altitude training and it helped me with my oxygen absorption. So now I got to keep on doing my oxygen thing, like doing hard cardio to keep my to keep that level up. And then maybe I should do that next time. I before I go, I'll just put it, I'll train real hard with the mask on. I mean, car to do a lot of cardio with the mask on. Use a stair stepper. That's probably the thing I should have used the stair stepper for like a couple hours, and this way I'd be able to do that climbing. You know not have that problem with the oxygen uh, deprivation so i get back to work i'm on and back to swing of things daughter has her first luckily we came back early enough that gave her time to adjust because tomorrow is her first day of school and it's the first day of high school and today we went to an open house 
they had for the freshmen. And we picked up a friend of hers who's a sophomore. And she gave us kind of a tour and stuff like that. Uh, so Sky, his friend Vicky, and she has other friends there. And uh, Vicky's a sweetheart, good kid, really funny. And I'm looking at the school. I've been there before, but I don't know. The last time I was in there, one of the times, it was kind of rainy or cloudy. And it's a big, it's Coral Shores High School in Tavernier, Florida. And it serves the Upper Keys. Everything from Lower Matacumbi uh, up to Ocean Reef. So it's got a big range. It, it goes, Christ, 50 miles if you took the whole range. But it's, you know, how the islands are. So it's all linear. So school, it's a big school for the area if you think about it because of the amount of people that live there. There's not that many people. So we go there. We see a lot of people we know. She sees a lot of her friends uh, the principal, I know the principal, uh, I'm friendly with her, and and some of the teachers from the gym and from bartending and things like that, and also the parents. And we're looking at the school, and it has a big open, it's an open plan school, would you call, because they have this big center courtyard that's open and sunny, has, uh, you know, obviously it's concrete and stuff like that, but they got trees in there and they got tables and things like that in the center. And they got this pod system for classrooms where you go in there and they have like five or six classrooms in each area. And that's where they have restrooms and stuff like that. You go in there and it makes sense. And they, you got a big open plane. You just walk there. It's just a beautiful school. It's a beautiful school. And I know you've probably been in schools, but I haven't been exposed to like high schools in a very long time. Very, very long time. A matter of fact, the last time I did go to the high school, I spoke at the high school. I spoke to an English class about resiliency. And I don't even remember all this stuff. They got the big screen monitors where they use for, you know, the, you know they sync with their... Uh, laptops so they can go and put their lesson plans up there and stuff. My God, it would have been, I would have definitely become a history t- teacher if if that was around. My biggest thing was I wasn't going to be able to use a chalkboard because I'm left-handed and I'm a messy writer. And I'm not a fast, and the faster I write, the sloppier it is. So then I would be like explaining everything to anyone. I never became a I was never really good with handwriting. I understand my handwriting mostly, and uh, I'm not a quick one. The quicker I do it, the messier it is. But this thing, having a, I could write notes. I was really good with note taking, and I could do. And that's what they do. They can put all the notes up on the uh, the monitor and stuff. I like know it's beautiful. And not only that, but the way the classes were laid out, and how friendly the teachers were, and how supportive they were. And the resources they had, I just thought it was wonderful. And I thought, man, I went to Catholic boys' school. And I, I mean, and I, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously the the, the kids are uh, they're good looking kids. They're all good looking kids. The girls are pretty. The guys are handsome. Um, you know, and it, you know, the regular still the regular groups come around a lot. So I thought, man. I I probably wouldn't enjoy the social aspects as much. That's got to be terrifying. It's got to be terrifying. But the educational thing they have, they seem to be on the ball in the way they describe it. And they give you a syllabus and they tell you what they expect from you and what things you're going to need and how they're going to teach and what, what's the percentage of online is going to be versus uh, in-person and things like that, and what they do, what they expect from you, what do you, they can do for you. I mean, it was just wonderful. I, I am really looking forward. And I told Sky, I said, you're very fortunate to be able to go to a place down here with this kind of high school. But then again, what do I know? Maybe a lot of high schools are like that now. You know, the way they paint education in the United States it seems like it's shit. And then I go in there and I go, look at this. It looks exciting to me. It looks vibrant. It looks new. It looks like cre- creative. Um, you know, maybe there's a, a big reason for hope. I think we, a lot of times when you hear news, you just get this 
this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. You don't hear about the good stuff. And the good stuff is that education is doing well and there's a lot of people that are committed to it. And the kids look like they genuinely want to be there. And there were kids that come in and walking when the uh, teachers were, uh, we went to each classroom that Sky had, and the teachers would uh, give a short speech and to everyone, try to gather them in there. And kids would stop along and give their little testimonials, the older kids. Oh, this is a great class. You're going to enjoy it. You know, these are the good, obviously, these are good kids. And one of the girls said, hey, listen, I would have paid more attention in this, uh, what is it called? She, my daughter is in honors pre, honors algebra, which was, I, I'm very happy that she is. <laughs> I'm surprised. But uh, I was real, I, I was excited for her. I was sincerely excited for her that the school's so good. And I know in their heads, if there's a relationship or something going on, that could ruin it. The interpersonal relationships could ruin their experience when everything else is so phenomenal there. It's so phenomenal. I just hope, you know, it's a shame. It's a, it's a shame that, you know, that, that interpersonal thing becomes a barrier for people. And, uh, but it was exciting. It was exciting. I got, I was happy about it. I don't know why I was happy about it. I I told my daughter, I said, hey, listen, I'm going to go and try to get another speaking gig there. Maybe I could do like a, a and dress to the auditorium. Like Jerry Seinfeld did. When he got to middle school, do a set. We can do a comedy set for him. Oh, I could do motivational speaking and stuff like that. That's amazing because the English, te- one of the English teachers who's one of my friends I worked with her, she invited me to speak to her class. And there's always things. That's all- I mean, I don't, I'm not a career day person to talk to them about, right? Because I'm a bartender. I'm not going to teach you any bartender. If you screw up and if you, uh, no insult to people that are bartenders, stuff like that. But if you screw it up, up enough in high school, yeah, you, you can become a bartender. <laughs> or if you do well and you want to be have an exciting job with a lot of different, you know. But, but my, my, my point is that uh, I, I speak more to motivations and, and general philosophy. And I try, I, would, I don't talk about politics or anything like that. It's just general life, how, how, how to get along. Right? It's exciting. So my father and I, I'm going to speak to the elder Jim Haran. He was talking to me yesterday. We were on the phone for quite a little time because I was doing adjustments to my website for the Keys Notary. And and people say, what the fuck is a notary? I mean, until you need one, you go, you just, you know, look at my ID, stamp the thing and, you know, I pay you $10, $10, $20, whatever. That's a notary, right? Well, yeah, it generally is. But this is other things we do. We do loan packages, and you got to figure out what's the proper identification they need, the proper places to sign, who needs to sign, where they need to sign, what needs to be notarized, um, what additional information they need on some sheets, but you don't go into detail on that. Uh, there's more legal things where you have to get people litigants or, or people that have lawsuits when they have to accept the package or settlement. They have to sign and they have to have it, uh, sometimes have it notarized. Sometimes not. Sometimes they need a witness. Sometimes they don't need a witness. So those things. And, and also I do wedding ceremonies and things like that. And there's places, sometimes law firms have to have uh, there's legal papers that need to be filed and stuff like that. Maybe don't need to do it in per, per person. They just need someone to physically file. I think now with COVID, it's moving along the electronic thing. So I may have missed the boat for that. But I'm attempting to, you know, deal with law firms because they they seem to have deep pockets and things like that. So I'm I'm working on my website, the Keys Notary. That's the name of my website. You notice the pattern? The keys bartender, the keys notary. I try to make it simple, right? 
this is what I do. I'm a notary in the keys. And then I put certified or loan signing agent, legal courier, wedding officiant. People say, why don't you just put notary? I said, well, it's in the name, keys notary. Why would you repeat it? And these are my services where the fees start at. You know, I didn't put a notary fees because notary fees are pretty much the same any place else. Ten bucks for every notice, notarized signature. But when you're traveling, you have to add a little, you know, for traveling. So I just wanted to make self-explanatory. I just wanted to clean. This is it. And I'm talking to my dad. And dad my dad got in this conversation. He goes, and he started talking about he's 80 years old. And he was talking about how his life, what course his life took. You know, when he went, went to school and what happened in school and then going into the Navy when his friends decided they wanted to join the reserves when they were juniors in high school. He ended up going there and became uh, an aviation electrician. And he enjoyed that and he did some things in there. He did a little... You know, did some instructing and all that. And then when he came out, he worked in manufacturing and sales. And then went back into instructing when he went back after he finished almost 20 years in manufacturing as a, in sales and in production. And he worked in the prisons. He taught prisoners life skills and computer skills and how the uh, vocational skills, skills they need when they come out and and you gave him advice on how to dress for that and you know, present yourself and things like that. And he talked about how much he enjoyed that job working at the prisons. And he also volunteered doing tax returns. But his main, main thing, he, he enjoyed the freedom that he had when he was working in manufacturing. He enjoyed the choices and the things he'd done when he was in the Navy. He enjoyed the people he met uh, in all those places, and especially in the in the prisons, you know, a lot of times when he was taken on a tour of it first time, that guy takes him on a tour and wants to see if people are intimidated. And my dad uh, said, you know, he says, and the way he described it, he says every so often, you know, it wasn't, you know, he said ninety nine percent of the time everyone was very happy to see him. Everyone was nice. They were very excited to go to the class. Uh, men and women, they like watching. Um, what movie was he was talking about? He was talking about a movie. I thought it was Saving Private Ryan, but he was watching another movie at the end. I'll probably bring it. And he said it really affected him. He, brought, he played a movie for him. He thought it would be kind of like a morale-building movie. And I remember the one he said, but I can't recall it now. And he said someone stayed behind. He said it really affected them. And he liked that. He liked the idea. You know, they go in there and it was a bet you know it was a better part of their day when they showed up for a vacational course in prison and my father said it he said it's mainly how you treat people how they react back to you and stuff like that and I kind of remember that because whenever I run into someone that particularly on the surface would be unpleasant that you can always try to change that first interaction or second interaction to say listen then we start off in a you know oh the, you know as long as you treat them that way and they don't they don't see it as you know crass they're going to be fine they're going to be fine but uh it was an exciting couple days back uh i'm relaxed i'm so i i i wouldn't have been able to do anything podcast on Saturday, you know, Saturday, I told you how I felt. And Sunday, still recovering. Uh, Monday had Monday and Tuesday off, two days off. So the next couple of weeks, I have two and a half days off in a row. And that's going to be like, oh, wonderful. I love working. I love working. I love doing my other jobs too. But it, it's nice to be going to work fresh. Like I go into work today at four o'clock. I look forward to it. And then I'm off tomorrow, Thursday. And maybe maybe I'll have a, uh, a signing then. Who knows? There's a lot of possibility. I'm looking forward to uh, this upcoming fall season. I'm looking forward to doing a, a 500th episode coming up. 
and I'm looking for probably if I get more time, I probably will do try to do shows from different venues. I know I've been threatening to do that. Probably you'd probably like it, wouldn't you? We'd like to hear some different voices, right? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, I appreciate you for listening. I'd like to thank everyone that uh, helped. Uh, you know, when I was on Pola, I'd like to thank. Uh, the people that gave us a tour, Justina, the beautiful Justina uh, and L.O.T. and uh, Justina Manco, Carolina, the beautiful Carolina Manco, the handsome Casper Manco, uh, the, the wonderful parents, Aga and Robert Manco. They uh, were very friendly to us over there and my, my family over there. Um, my, my, you know, my Every Kasha and Ta, uh, Jeshik, my nephews uh, uh, Alex and Casper, um, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, and my brother-in-law Bogdan and Edita uh, Bartek, Bartek, my nephew Bartek, who's in his early twenties gave me a tattoo i'll post that i'll post a new tattoo it's on the other arm i was going to get it around the swords but for some reason it's hard to get a balance on the swords because we have it on a muscle so some of it looks long some of it looks short um am i missing people over there i'm missing somebody oh my my uh gosha margaret who is over there that's abby's second youngest sister and uh her daughter, uh, Muriel, a beautiful, yeah, beautiful girl, sweet girl. Uh, my daughter, Sky and Abby. It was just a beautiful, a lovely vacation for me. And it was an experience I'll remember. I do appreciate that. I think it's always, you know, it's always a good investment in time for yourself. Whatever you enjoy doing, whatever recharges your battery. It just gives you a fresh perspective on life, I think. There's a lot of good things out there. And try to try to afford some time off for yourself, even if it's a little. Uh, uh, you know, especially all through the trouble that we have. And, uh, just go and do it and enjoy. Because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, if you like the show, please share it with your family and friends. I'd like to uh, ask you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And that's the Keys Bartender. If you have any questions for me, you can email them to me at jim at keysbartender.com or message me on any of those uh, social pages. You know, uh, I'd like to thank you very much. And here we go. I'm going to go out with some a little music.